a very good afternoon to all. On behalf of the Faculty of Management, Social Sciences and Humanities of General Sir John Katalaula Defense University, welcome you all to the second parallel technical session of TESOL of the 16th International Research Conference under the theme Achieving Resilience Through Digitalization, Sustainability and Sectoral Transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will be chaired by Professor Chitra Jayatilaka, a professor in English at the Department of English and Linguistics and, the, and a faculty member of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, Sri Lanka. The rapporteur for this session is Ms. Tamara Kotalavala, Senior Lecturer, Department of Languages. I have the honor of giving a brief introduction of the chairperson of this session, Professor Chitra Jayatilaka. Professor Chitra Jayatilaka holds a PhD in English from the University of Kiele, United Kingdom, and MA in TESOL from the Postgraduate Institute of English of the Open University, and MA in Linguistics from the University of Kalania, and a BA Honors in English from the University of Sri Jayavadanapura, Sri Lanka. Her academic focus revolves around the intersection of post-colonial literature with a special emphasis on post-colonial theater as well as English and cultural studies, second language acquisition, and teaching English for s as a second language. And I would like to invite the presenters to the head table. <laughs> Ms. HMR Gunavardhana. Ms. S. D. Pettavalu, Mr. U. G. W. R. Jayatilaka, Ms. R. V. A. R. K. Patirana, Now, I cordially invite the session chairperson, Professor Chitra Jayatilaka, to commence the session. Over to you, madam. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope uh, I'm audible enough. Am I audible enough? Am I audible enough? Yes. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the 16th International Conference of KDU and the technical session two on TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. We have uh, four papers, four presenters, who will be presenting uh, on papers on their research related to teaching English to speakers of other languages. Let me, before we begin, let me introduce some of our rules and regulations. Each presenter will have 15 minutes for the presentation, and after 10 minutes, you'll be warned of the time. After 10 minutes, and after yeah, once again, be just before one minute. Those are warning signs, and uh, for you to be aware of the, aware of the time framework. And uh, after each presentation, we will have a discussion session, and questions will be asked and requested from the audience first, and then perhaps from the other others who are seated here, including the presenters. Uh, so, let me introduce our first speaker. First uh, speaker is uh, Ms. Gunawardhana. She's a fourth year undergraduate uh, at University of Kalania, currently reading for the Bachelor of Arts degree in teaching English as a second language. Her topic is titled, Detailed Study Based on the Effect of the Official Language Policy of Sri Lanka Towards English Language Usage in the land and 
district registry. Nuara Elia district. Over to you, Ms. Gunamadana. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So today I'm going to present a study based on the effect of the official language policy of Sri Lanka towards English language usage in the Land and District Registry, LDR, Nuwara Elia District. So for introduction, you can see the language policies uh, that are amended in Sri Lanka. So language planning in general is considered a large scale phenomenon, in fact, and national planning is always undertaken by governments. And it aims to influence or change ways of speaking or literacy practices within a particular society. In Sri Lankan context, the incident where the post-colonial language policy that is consecrated Sinhala as the only official language of the country in 1956 proves that declining legitimate minority language rights uh, which led to language-based conflicts. So however, the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the 1978 Constitution granting both Sinhala and Tamil the status of the official language can be highlighted as a unified approach that led to many transformation in the government administrative sector. Accordingly, the present study uncovers the effect of the official language policy of Sri Lanka towards the English language usage uh, in the land and district registry in Nuwaraelia district. So to identify the effect of the official language policy in Sri Lanka towards this English language usage, uh, the Nuwaraelia district was considered and the LDR, the Land and District Registry, which is accountable for civil registration, land registration, title registration, also considered. It shows a clear multi-ethnicity, which consists a higher number of Tamil-speaking communities in the upcountry, Sinhalese and Moors, uh, so that it is one of the ideal districts to investigate the effectiveness of the language policy. So the rationale behind the study was uh, the clear multi-ethnicity in the Nuwaraelia district and the higher number of population visits land and district registry for various purposes. And also it is also an area with a large number of foreign tourist attractions and functioning a large number of NGOs. And also the challenges faced by both officials and uh, ethnic communities due to the language barriers and a district which showcases a vibrant usage of multiple uh, languages depending on the social status. So the objectives uh, for the study was to examine the contribution of the language policy and it showed comments towards the usage of English in the administrative sector of Sri Lanka and also to study how the systematized implementation of language policies help to achieve efficiency in the administrative sector. So for the literature review, uh, 
there are many scholars who have posed their opinion on this uh, language policy and national planning and also uh, the uh, official language policy of Sri Lanka. So according to Koparheva 2009, many South Asian countries raise a number of important issues of concern for those interested in language policy and planning. And also Tollefson 1991, in Sri Lanka, the language issue has historically been an arena of, uh, for struggle where the majority of the country's population has sought to exercise power over minority ethnic groups. And according to Kanagaraja 2005, a review of existing literature on the subject reveals a noticeable gap in studies related to language planning in Sri Lanka. When we move on to the methodology, the study design and setting, uh, the research followed mainly a qualitative approach and a purpose is sampling. And the objective was to get better understanding through both structured and unstructured interviews and participant observation on the effect of the official language policy uh, of Sri Lanka in English language usage in the land and district registry in Norelia district. So the study sample contained 42 administrative officers and 25 local people who came to the office to receive services and also mixed method was followed. In the data discussion, uh, the current usage of language policy within LDR was taken into consideration. So even though the constitution demands uh, documents in all three languages within the practical approach, we notice some gaps. And uh, it can be observed that the language obligations are limited to theory without much efficiency when performing within the given context. And also in the language policy, it is stated that a citizen is entitled to receive communication from and to communicate and transact business with any official in his cap official capacity in either the Tamil or English languages. However, this research found that the language used for documentation mainly depend on the administrative purpose and the duties under different job titles, because as you can see here, the applications for search duplicate of deeds and also the application for search of land registered should be filled only with English as they are handled by the lawyers. And also uh, Tamil speaking people were unable to obtain their essential documents in Tamil. And on the other hand, although there is a need for all three languages, documentation is not systematic. On the other hand, the form filling is also not according to the language policy. And almost all forms are supposed to fill in singular language, though the criteria are given in English. Another thing is signboards. So another necessity that should be focused when providing adequate working capacity within the administrative divisions is the availability of linguistic friendly displays such as name boards, sign boards, and direction boards in Sinhala, Tamil, and English, especially in an area like Norelia. So according to Vakkumbra 2016, it is mainly because in the 1978 constitution, non-discrimination principle monitored by the official language commission. So we noticed that the sign boards that were available in the LDR in the Norelia district mainly followed this rule and uh, they consisted all the three languages in the sign boards that they displayed. So when it comes to the implications taken by the authorities to reduce the linguistic tension between the Tamil and the administrative workers, so within the administration level, they have taken a few measures. So uh, to enhance the respected language proficiencies of its workers, the government also has implemented offering language courses for workers. And also another measure that has been implemented by the government was to reduce the linguistic pressure is offering incentive allowances for language qualifications that the workers obtain. So that the allowance is used to encourage officials to follow language courses to gain expected competency in relevant language and use the knowledge in a way to minimize the linguistic pressure. And another step uh, taken by the government to reduce this uh, linguistic pressure was uh, to uh, the 
workers has to obtain minimum a C pass of English language in the GCE O levels, uh, and it is considered as an eligibility uh, to apply to government job opportunities. And also there were implementations taken by the authorities towards the public. Uh, I should say it was really appreciated that the study could observe that there is a bilingual counter at the main entrance uh, of the LDR, which consists a bilingual speaker who is competent in both Sinhala and uh, Tamil language. But English was not there despite it is considered as the link language by the constitution. And there were also other services providing counters which consisted both Sinhala and Tamil speakers to assist public accordingly and guide them to uh, get their services done. So uh, the study also discovered the reasons to improve the standard of English language usage within the administrative sector. So one thing was there are possible reasons that these government employees possess to improve the standards of their English language usage. That some one point is dealing with international stakeholders. So these standards were mainly observed within the upper level positions that was very much highlighted. For instance, they should consider their standard language skills as the first major fact was when dealing with international stakeholders. And also, as I have mentioned here, for various communication purposes. So the efficiency of English language usage as a link language when serving for other professional purposes was also considered. So English acts as the link language at some instances and also as an official language so that uh, its status within the administrative level should be enhanced. So for conclusion, uh, I should say English does not play a significant role as a link language, even though the constitution says it's the link language in the Nurele district. So there is an essential need to upgrade the status of official language policy in the government sector, especially the administrative sector, and also necessary measures should be developed and further implemented uh, to maintain the quality of service provided by the land and district registry. So for recommendations, English language uh, usage should be further promoted in government offices and also Sinhala and Tamil must follow the official language policy in equal manner. More attention should be given uh, towards language skill development programs and standards of existing language programs should be increased and also official documentations should be maintained in all three languages. So these are the references that I have used. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Gunawardena, for your presentation. We'll have the discussion at the end of each presentation. And I will now invite the second presenter, Ms. S.D. Pettavadu. And her topic is teaching of idiomatic expressions in teaching English as a second language in Sri Lanka. Over to you. Right. Um, a very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Amindi Pettavadu, and my co authors are uh, Varni Amarakon and Amanda Pereira. Uh, we are final year undergraduates, TESOL undergraduates of General Sir John Kotulavada Defense University. Um, so, we are very pleased to present our um, research findings and insights on the topic teaching of idiomatic expressions in teaching English as a second language in Sri Lanka. So before we delve into the details, let me just brief you, th brief you through the context and the importance of our study, research study. All right, um, so to begin with, everybody should have an, understand, an understanding of as to what exactly idioms mean. 
So ADMs are referred to as um, expressions and words um, which has meanings beyond the literal interpretations. And these ADMs um, tend to carry figurative or metaphorical meanings. Now, also these are very like these idioms are very intertwined with um, a language, culture, customs, and traditions. So, yeah. Um, so it's very important to teach idiomatic expressions when it comes to teaching English as a second language in Sri Lanka. Um, there are several reasons as to there are there are several reasons why I say so. So first, um, getting exposed to idiomatic expressions, especially second language learners, it enhances their communicative competency, which means the ability to um, comprehend and use the language um, in various cultural and social contexts. So this ability is very much important because it sort of like um, enhances and develops one's communicative ability and fluency. Um, see, so the other thing is um, idiomatic expressions, since they are a very integral part of authentic language, um, it's for second language learners, like I said earlier, it's very important. Uh, the reason is these idiomatic expressions have not only, uh, not only have um, lexical and grammatical aspects, but also have understanding of, um, understanding and using of uh, language in authentic contexts. So yeah, so that's the um, basic context and the introduction. So now um, let's move on to the research, uh, research questions that we studied upon. So in our research study, uh, the research questions that we sort of like analyzed and studied upon was uh, first, to what extent are idioms included in grade 10 and 11 English textbooks in Sri Lanka? And then to what extent can idiomatic expressions be taught um, using these materials. So moving on uh, to dive into the objectives of our research. First, our objective was to, to find sort of like to find the frequency of idiomatic expressions included in both grade and uh, eleven textbooks, uh, especially from local Sri Lankan local syllabus, and then to see the exposure that the second language learners in Sri Lanka get um, get through this content like content which is mentioned in these textbooks. And third, um, to reveal the limitations in these current textbooks and syllabuses, particularly the confinement of um, idiomatic expressions of one specific English variety. And then to highlight uh, the minimal exposure to Sri Lankan second language learners um, through these great both um, textbooks. And um, next, the, our objective was to propose improvements to textbooks and syllabuses, um, which in a way that which they can enhance the understanding of idioms and promote more comprehensive exposure to idiomaticity. So last but not least, our objective was to stress the necessity as like why this exposure to idiomatic, idiomatic expressions are needed. So yeah, those are our objectives. And moving on uh, to study upon our research questions and um, uh, our research study, the methodology that we used was to be, we sort of like conducted a corpus-based textbook analysis focusing on the idiomatic expressions used in these uh, textbooks, in these textbook in the sense both grade 10 and 11. So for this, we used a computer-based um, software called Langsbox. Um, I'm pretty sure my colleagues has uh, heard of it, the corpus based, you know. Um, so as for the data preparation, we imported these soft copies of the textbooks into Langsbox and also we made sure that we treated each textbook as a separate document to avoid any inconvenience or any complexities. Um, so when analyzing the frequency, um, we utilized um, like several additional settings in this software code, which is Langsbox. And also, we initiated the analysis process. And when generating results, we allowed the software, which is the Langsbox, allowed the software to process the text, and also we generated results based on the um, criteria defined 
in the software. Um, so now uh, it's time to dive into the main key factors that we um, came across when we're doing this research. So as for the main key takeaways, first, we found that there is a very limited um, inclusion of EVMs in grade 10 and 11 pupils books. And then both grade 10 and 11 pupils books contain only one, one um, activities which is, which is related to idiomatic expressions, which is actually surprising. Um, so as you can, I'm not sure if you can see this um, specific paper here. But anyway, this is the grade 10 um, book, specifically the chapter which has idiomatic expressions in it. So you see, um, this is just an introduction to six idioms with no context given where actually these um, idiomatic expressions can be used. And you see no practical activities also given. Uh, it's the same with grade 11 textbook. Um, just an introduction to five idioms, no text uh, context even where these expressions can be used, and also no practice activities are given. So yeah, um, to conclude, after all this, after not, like after doing all this stuff, to conclude, we can say a research study, this whole analysis reveals this, uh, the the limited amount of idiomatic expressions included in both grade 10 and 11 textbooks. And also particularly uh, the idioms included in these textbooks are from one specific variety, which is British English. And also there is a lack of um, inclusion of idioms from varieties of English. So we, we know that there are different varieties of English, American English, uh, Chinese English, Sri Lankan English, so, um, so so these varieties of English in these textbooks are lacking and it's evident, very obvious, very clear. Um, also, the activities provided here do not provide sufficient opportunity for students to like um, get to know what actually like uh, where these provided um, idiomatic expressions can be used, uh, where can they actually um, used it, in what occasions they can use. So it's very lacking and like I said, said earlier, no practice activities are given. So this uh, limited exposure to idiomatic expressions can obstruct the, the second language learners' um, ability to sort of like function in the authentic language because it hinders their communicative competency and fluency. You know, like getting exposed to idiomatic expressions give them the ability to um, function and function in authentic language uh, in, a, in a very fluent and a natural way. So that means this exposure, limited exposure, sort of, it hinders it. So as for the recommendations, um, obviously for obvious reasons, the incorporation of, um, I mean, textbooks should incorporate idioms from varieties of English and this, um, idioms from varieties of English broadens, develops the student's exposure to real world language usage and diversity. Um, so when you, you see, when you get exposed to different uh, varieties of English, specifically when it comes to DM, you don't like tend to struggle when communicating even with native speakers because, because uh, let's say, uh, let's say, you are abroad, let's say you are in America. What if they come up with American idiom? So you should have the, you know, you should have the exposure to like um, decode that discourse so that you won't struggle and you will understand, okay, okay this is uh, what is meant by this, you know? So you won't, uh, you won't struggle. And as for the contextual usage, um, when making textbooks, definitely contextual usage should be prioritized. It's a priority, it's a must. Why? Because, you know, without any context given, how can someone like see how, wh where exactly these are popping, where exactly, um, where exactly I should use this? Yeah, you see, you see my point, right? Uh, okay, so 
as to the recommendation when it comes to contextual, uh, contextual usage, uh, presentation of EDM should not be in isolation. It should be in authentic context. And when demonstrating how um, these idiomatic expressions, textbooks should take necessary steps to like um, expose the second language learners with real life examples, not just um, some activities where they can like uh, match. Mm, yeah, so obviously practice activities should be included and provided. Um, we can do this through listening and speaking activities. Um, so with that being said, I conclude our presentation. This is the reference that we refer to. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Fetavadu for your presentation. for the interesting presentation. Okay, we'll, uh, let's invite uh, Mr. U.G. R. Jayatilaka for his presentation on factors to consider promoting speaking competence of national languages of Sri Lanka. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear judges of the panel, and the presenters, uh, presenters here present today. So uh, I would be presenting uh, uh, the insights and the deep in, uh, facts that we have gained through our research, which is also presented in the research paper as well, on factors to consider the promoting the speaking competence of national languages of Sri Lanka. So. Moving on to our background of the study, the research paper. So we came up with this topic because mainly a deep background in our country as well. Uh, due to the 30 years conflict, we have identified that language plays a crucial role in this conflict between the two main ethnicities, the Sinhalese and the Tamil. We believe that the language played a huge role in terms of uh, uh, hostilities between the communities because of the language barrier especially the speaking competency and the understanding level. So we even use the Quebec province, uh, which is the pro province of Canada, which they, they had the similarities on this case on the speaking competency level. We use that study as well to gain, okay, what can we relate on that study, on that issue and the Sri Lankan issue as well. So we came up with the background of, that, of, of those studies and we continued our research paper, through our, our research paper. So as you can see in this table, this, is this, uh, this table was taken out from the Census Statistics Department data on 2019 on the speaking competency age about 10 years. So you can see the single is national language, the Tamil national language and the English official language here across ethnicities, their speaking competency population. So this is the population sector wise of uh, the speaking competency uh, age about 10 years. Uh, so these, this data is also taken from the Census and Statistics Department of Sri Lanka, the 2019 data. So you might even notice when it comes to the, uh, the official English language, especially Tamil national language, this is slight uh, decreasement in the Tamil national language proportionate to the English national language comparing to the Sinhalese national language, the speaking competency. Okay, why is that? We believe that uh, most of the, uh, especially when it comes to our study, the single is ethnicity is focused only on the learning, the single is, uh, especially the speaking competency, or focused only on learning the single speaking competency as well as the English competency, but not focusing on the speaking competency of the Tamil national language. So this is why we are focusing on this research study, because we believe that 
language barrier is a national level issue in Sri Lanka in terms of the speaking competency regarding the inter-ethnic communication and understanding among these different ethnicities because it is acknowledged to be a crucial important point in the ethnocentric conflicts, conflicts in Sri Lanka. This is also further approved by the United Nations Commission for Human Rights in 2012, ensuring language parity is important as resettlement and rehabilitation. Further, it was also approved by the United Nations for Coordination on Humanitarian Affairs in 2012, making sure they're mindful of verbal correspondence on both public dialects. In this case, the national languages, the two national languages, among nectars would be an instrument for noteworthy reconciliation efforts. So with that, we identified uh, one main objective of this research, which is an, along with the three sub-objectives as well for the study, to identify the factors that hinder verbal communication between the two linguistic communities in Sri Lanka, which is Singhala and Tamil, and to explore the factors that can motivate the process of improving the number of speakers who are competent in Singhala and Tamil crosswise of ethnicities. Along with the three objectives, to identify the recommendations and suggestions commenced by the experienced professionals that we interviewed in our research in order to develop the speaking competency in the both national languages of Sri Lanka, as well as explore the factors that hinder those uh, speaking competency education and to investigate their positive experience and demonstrate their language competency to foster the reconciliation process in Sri Lanka. So yes, we, since we had this uh, 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 very uh, in-depth uh, background and the research problems that we found out, we, de we decided to go along with the following uh, design methods in our research. So uh, we, c we consisted of focus group interviews, which consisted of ni uh, nine individuals who were both in the private and the public sector. And uh, most, of, most of these uh, individuals, we gave them customized questions according to their destination based on their career expertise, their background, uh, their professional uh, solutions for, the, for this topic, as well as we gave even more emphasis for predominantly homogeneous provinces with more speakers of one national language. For example, if we take the southern province, we interviewed Tamil nationality in the southern province. Likewise, we interviewed a Singhalese nationality living in Jaffna district. So with that, we developed a theoretical model as well for this research which is Bennett's development of intercultural sensitivity, the DIMS model, because it provides a theoretical reflex to the study. Why is that? Because we believe that we are talking about an ethnocentric solution, uh, ethnocentric question, how to solve an ethno-relative problem. So we believe that this Bennett's development model, the intercultural development and the intercultural sensitivity model would describe a standard way in which people experience, interpret and inter interact across cultural differences because we are using the language aspect here. Language aspect is a crucial role in the uh, cultural aspect as well. So we presented as a development continuum that progresses from the ethnocentric perspective to ethno-relative perspective. So along with that, you can uh, now identify the interviews, the individuals that we interviewed across this uh, research study. So as you can see, they are, most of them are from predominantly from the uh, homogeneous provinces, while we also consider multicultural provinces, which is the Western province, in order to get value depth uh, insights into our research study. So with that, we came up with some uh, data collection methods and tool, which we believe that these were the important ways to get more value and richer qualitative data. We conducted our interviews in a semi-structured manner to gather more qualitative data. And yes, we also had audio recordings because we need to gather and analyze the deep richer data that consisted with their consent as well. Also to gather contextual understanding because it allowed us to dwell into their factors, the contextual factors surrounding the experiences. For example, people who served in the North and East, the Singhalese people who served in the North and East and the Tamil people who served in the uh, South provinces, we need to get their uh, broad social, cultural and personal context in order to identify their, uh, the, identify the facts and the solutions that they will bring up for this research problem and the topic. Also, we added nine questions based on their career expertise, their career background and uh, knowledge in relevance to the research topic. Finally, we also maintain the anonymity of the data as well. 
So these are the ethical considerations that since we are talking about a very uh, sensitive problem in our country, we even consider highly the ethical considerations of our research. We were also received, uh, we also received department level permission to gather this data and uh, analyze this data as well. So formal consent from both sides we obtain. And along with that, we came up with five thematic analysis for this research paper. Since we are talking about the speaking competency of the national language, promoting the factors to consider the national language speaking competency, we came up with five thematic analysis aspects. The first aspect is benefits of bilingual speaking skills, the political aspect, the educational aspect, the professional aspect, and the cultural aspect. For we believe that these five aspects are crucial in terms of developing a solution for our research topic and our research problem. So when it comes to the benefits of bilingual speaking skills, we all know that, uh, we believe that in, during our research that human mind and human nature is driven by motivation. So how motivation can be driven by? Because through gifts, awards, re rewards, human mind act accords, uh, human mind's motivation and aspect ac act according to those perspectives. So what we believe that, if we could highlight this benefit, the benefit part of a bilingual speaker's ability, that could give more motivational factors to consider people on learning the national, the two national languages speaking competency. For example, the single is could learn the Tamil national language speaking competency, can improve that speaking competency, as well as the Tamil person could improve his or her uh, speaking competency in the single is language, which will also be a boost for their career, which I will be talking about the professional aspect, and this will also reduce the cultural gap between those two communities, because like I said, the Bennett's DIMS model, they could, from denial to acceptance, they can go through, they can develop that uh, uh, transport from the denial to uh, per denial to accept through this understanding. Also the political aspect, which is obviously we have to strengthen the uh, constitutional factors in order to strengthen the speaking competency in the educational sector through the political institutions, as well as with that we believe that promotional campaigns also can be carried out through these political institutions as well in order to make sure people start learning both national languages speaking competency. And yes, with that, the educational aspect, most of our interviews believe that the present education system is not sufficient for the speaking competency because the speaking competency is not highlighted or developed throughout this present education system, only the writing and the, read, uh, write, writing and the reading perspective. So that's why we believe that uh, educational system, the, the, our interviews also uh, responded that the education system, there should be a change and help it towards developing uh, the speaking competency in the education system. With that, the professional aspect. Because we believe that if, a, for an example, based on our interviews, they believe that learning a second national language according to the ethnicities would boost their career, which also leads us to the cultural aspect because with those developments, the intercultural hostility can be reduced because the, the understanding level of those ethnicities would increase because of the speaking competency. So with that, we believe that national languages play a huge role in peace building and reconciliation efforts in Sri Lanka. And second national language competency, the speaking competency is an added advantage for the future reconciliation process. Of course, there are hindrances such as insufficient educational system. We believe that that could be solved. With, because we believe that in order to uh, strengthen the educational aspect, there should be also, there should be political institutions in, in develop with this process. And schools and universities especially should be focusing on developing the speaking competencies of both national languages. For example, one of our respondents, who is a Tamil teacher in the Western province, even uh, believe that this present school system does not improve that speaking competency. As well as in the North, there are lack of single teachers in the North as well to improve their speaking competency. So with that, we believe that the social blending also can happen because with the communication part developing, we could eat, we can develop each other's uh, communication understanding since we will be able to connect together in both the national languages, both national languages. So also with that, finally we believe that mutual respect will be maintained as well as promoting the speaking competencies of both national languages via, you know, job requirements, uh, career related promotions, salary bonuses. These are all motivational factors to make people to improve their sec second national language speaking competency. So with the implications of a study, we believe that the five aspects, the benefits of bilingual speaking, the political aspect, the cultural aspect, the educational aspect, and the professional aspect would lead us to have an effective solution on this research topic. 
So I believe that, uh, so these are the references that we used, uh, as I mentioned, in the presentation as well. So we, I believe that you might have gained some valuable insights and facts throughout this presentation. I would be open to questions as well. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation as well. Thank you, Mr. Jayatiluka, for your presentation. Uh, let me introduce the other one, uh, the, our last speaker, Ms. R.V.A.R.K. Patirana, and she's going to speak on the title, Investigating the Features of Academic Writing in Research Among Undergraduates. Over to you, Ms. Patirana. And uh, let me also introduce Ms. Patirana has received her MPhil and MA degree in linguistics from the University of Kalanir, Sri Lanka. Uh, she uh, currently holds the position of lecturer in English at the Sri Lanka Institute of Advanced Technological Education. Over to you, Ms. Patirana. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is our presentation on investigating uh, the features of academic writing in research among undergrads. Uh, I'm Renuka Patirana, and my co-author is Savi Sandini Blokuliana. Uh, this is the outline of our research study. Let me start with the academic writing. Uh, as you all know, academic writing plays a vital role uh, in uh, academic sector. Uh, uh, it is arguably the most significant skills in academic context since writing uh, is uh, uh, the main method of academic communication. It is also the most difficult skills for students to master. So there are several features of academic writing. Among them, uh, we have focused on the use of personal pronouns and the uh, use of hedging words in research writing for the present investigation. Uh, as you all know, hedging words are mostly common used in academic context for giving tentative statements. Further, uh, though uh, the first person uh, Pronouns, I, V, I are uh, not uh, used in academic writing to omit the subjective matter or subjective tone. Many students still use personal pronouns in their uh, academic writings. Um, uh, the corpus linguistic was also incorporated into the present study as the uh, data evaluation tool. You know, you all know a corpus is a, a collection of linguistic data. Uh, the plural form is corpora, uh, which is used in academic writing for various purposes, such as uh, to study language patterns and structure, to compile dictionaries and ensure accurate uh, the word definitions and also as it's uh, in language uh, teaching materials development uh, uh, through uh, we can use for the error analysis uh, so on. The research objectives of our uh, the study to examining the uh, Utilization of hedgings in academic research writing. Uh, basically, uh, explore the frequency of uh, using personal pronouns in academic uh, writing. And uh, actually, we wanted to introduce a mini corpus called AWRC, standard for academic writing in research corpus. These are the significance of the present study. And we'll move on to the methodology. 
as a sample of 26 research proposals was uh, was collected from students belongs to uh, 30 intake 38 of faculty uh, the law faculty students at Gen uh, general sir john kotlal and defense university uh, then all the proposals were extracted into a text file excluding unnecessary details such as titles subheadings uh, spaces and punctuations uh, to compile the mini corpus, data from the text file were copied into the ANCON concordance, a software tool that was downloaded for the per for uh, uh, downloaded for this purpose. Subsequently, the frequency option in uh, ANCON was utilized to gather the respective findings. Uh, through comparative analysis, these findings were uh, then evaluated to draw a conclusion. According to the findings, as demonstrated by the data provided, uh, the frequency uh, and manner in which students employ the pr uh, pronoun I in their academic writing can significantly impact the overall academic conviction of their work. The provided uh, statistic indicates uh, that the usage of pronoun V in the context mentioned violates academic conventions and formalities. Moreover, using V in individual research can indicate lack of understanding uh, of proper grammar among undergraduate students. It is crucial for authors, uh, specific, especially students, to adhere to established grammar rules and academic writing guidelines to maintain the integrity and the professionalism of their work. Examining the usage of uh, pronoun V and I in academic uh, papers highlights the potential uh, negative consequences in imbalance uh, in their usage. This disadvantage encompasses uh, uses of clarity, the subjective or personal tone, the risk of bias, uh, uh, disregards for disciplinary stance, and potential decrease in interesting of their readers. It is crucial to recognize uh, the importance of thoughtful and deliberate pron uh, pronoun usage in order to uphold the integrity and the impact of academic writing. Next, the model verbs, uh, the play, uh, a crucial role in uh, proposal writing as they allow uh, writers to convey the range of attitudes, including certainty, possibility, duty, and recommendation. Common model uh, verbs employed by undergraduates uh, include can, would, could, and may, might. The presence of these model verbs indicates the student's intention to express their intentions and navigate uh, the tone of their professional proposals effectively. In the context of hedging, it is, notable, uh, it is notable that 19 out of the 26 Undergraduate students include model verbs in their proposal writing. The frequency of usage varies among these model verbs, but it appears that uh, students heavily rely on model verbs in their proposals to articulate their objectives and perspectives. Based on the research findings, it has been observed that adverbial phrases are not commonly utilized in undergraduate proposal writing. The absence of adverbial phrases indicates that students may rely on alternative linguistic strategies such as the use of model verbs and specialized word choices to convey their ideas and uh, assertions uh, effectively within their proposals.
In conclusion, uh, the statistical analysis reveals that uh, undergrads uh, exhibit a relative low frequency of hedging verb usage uh, in their proposals with uh, only seven out of uh, to, uh, out of the 26 students incorporating hedging verbs. This suggests that students may not rely on hedging verbs as extensively as they do not, do, as do on model verbs. It is important to know that the specific choice and frequency of hedging verbs employed by students may vary, uh, influenced by individual writing styles and academic conventions. The current study utilizing sim uh, sample data has provided a comprehensive analysis of the usage of personal pronouns and hedging in academic writing, especially, especially within research proposals. Moreover, the findings have revealed that uh, students possess limited awareness of the uh, distinctive features of academic writing as evidenced by their excessive use of first person pronouns such as I and we. Additionally, uh, the study has highlighted uh, the inadequate utilization of adverbial phrases in research writing. Consequently, it is recommended to prioritize the instruction of adverse hedging techniques techniques in research writing as this will prove advantages in both academic and professional context. Finally, as the recommendations, a mini corpus can be used as a method of error analysis among students and teachers and also uh, should provide, no, we should provide knowledge uh, of academic writing in school education sector uh, to make them ready for the university level. And also we should focus on teaching important academic skills like reading, writing, and citing sources in all degree programs. This will make our academic community strong. This is our reference for the study. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Ms. Patirana. Yes. <laughs> now it's uh, time for us to raise questions and get anything clarified and uh, extend their discussion as well and uh, I must of course uh, let you once again uh, let me once again uh, introduce you the speakers first one is uh, Miss Gunawardana from the University of Kalani and she's an undergraduate the fourth year undergraduate and uh, the second one uh, Miss uh, SD Petavadu is also uh, an undergraduate of this university and the third speaker is also a fourth, finally undergraduate. Mr. Jay Tilaka is also a finally undergraduate from this university. And our final speaker was uh, Ms. Patirana, and uh, and uh, she is uh, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a lecturer in English at the Sri Lanka Institute of Advanced Technological Education. First of all, uh, now let's start uh, our discussion session. And you can raise any questions from uh, any speaker with regard to the speaker. The first speaker, let me recall, the first speaker spoke on, the title was, Detailed Study Based on the Effect of Official Language Policy of Sri Lanka Towards English Language use in Usage in the Land and District Registry, Nurelia District. The second one was on teaching of idiomatic expressions in teaching English as a second language in Sri Lanka. Third study was on factors to consider promoting speaking competence of national languages of Sri Lanka. The last one was uh, on 
investigating the features of academic writing in research among undergraduates. Over to you, the audience. Sure. Uh, my question uh, goes to uh, S.D. Pettawadu. Now, one of your research objectives uh, is to stress the usage of idi idiomatic expressions. So that is one of your research objectives. I would like to know how uh, did you do it in your study? Um, so you Thank you for the question. So you're asking me uh, what my methodology in like objectives stress you use it to stress. Yeah. So I'm asking the way that you did it in your study. So our objective was to like stress upon why this inclusion of um, idiomatic expressions from varieties of English is needed in Sri Lanka for specifically second language learners. So. Um, I think uh, I think the question is about uh, to further give the details about how you have come up conducted with the research. I think it. Okay. So uh, for this, um, like I said in my presentation, we conducted a methodology. Uh, for the methodology, we conducted a corpus-based analysis. So for this, we took both grade and ten, uh, grade ten and eleven textbooks. So we sort of like went through the textbooks and see exactly where are these in, um, inclusion of idiom idiomatic expressions. So it, uh, it is based on a textbook analysis. Yes. So I would like to recommend now here in the title you say teaching of idiomatic expressions. So I think it should be like a textbook analysis on because uh, we, ha we, we couldn't see a teaching part of your presentation. So mm -hmm. this is just a suggestion. So I wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. And uh, do you have any other questions to raise on the same subject, uh, questions or any comments, any positive or constructive comments, or any clarifications that you need to ask? Let me uh, draw my attention to some of my questions. Let me draw your attention to some of my questions. Uh, before I uh, tell you anything about any of the, the presenters or the presentations, uh, shall we give another round of applause to everybody for their attempt? <laughs> and uh, be, be, be novice uh, researchers, I would, of course, first of all, uh, uh, highly appreciate your attempts, really, and you all are young and very novice researchers, and I would highly appreciate your, your, your efforts, research efforts. Uh, that's the, the common positive comment and, and my common observation. And uh, let me also, before I uh, specifically ask or direct some of the questions or make some of the suggestions on each of the individual presenters, let me also tell you one common observation that I have noted, uh, to my understanding this, this is common. All your recommendations should be match to your research objectives that you have done in the current research. What I have noted commonly is many of your recommendations, many of your recommendations are not in line with the objectives that you have attempted to explore during the current research. That's a common observation. Let me uh, now, uh, before I give you the chance to raise other questions from the other presenters, let me ask another question from the second speaker. Um, these are not, of course, the questions. This, please consider them as some of the suggestions. Perhaps you can, uh, give certain your, like your, your, your thoughts really in the future, right? These are suggestions. Uh, I'm not going to threaten you. This is a conference. I'm not your supervisor. Uh, I know you are a, you are a fourth year student and I really appreciate your attempts 
as a fourth year student and presenting at a conference of this nature itself is a great thing, right? Uh, uh, in addition to what uh, Ms. Tamara has pointed out, pay your attention to the titles. When you say teaching of idiomatic expressions, that itself suggests that you have not done anything in relation to teaching. This is something about idiomatic expressions. You are exploring, you have explored the frequency of idiomatic expressions in textbooks. In textbooks. By selecting two textbooks prescribed for the national school level education. And uh, uh, and okay, uh, let me just raise one question. And if you want further clarifications or comments, you can meet me over the uh, like uh, during the tea break or after this one. I will just let you know some other suggestions and comments. Let me raise one. Uh, uh, let me, of course, uh, share with you some of my your suggestions. Perhaps uh, you were mentioning about a variety of, uh, two different varieties of English, really. Uh, and you were referring to the prescribed text. Have you ever thought of the rules and regulations of the prescribed text? Is the national curriculum, does the national curriculum allow the test designers to use different varieties of English? There are different varieties of English. And you were referring to the different varieties of English in refer in, with reference to the countries as well. Your example suggested that you were referring to American English and British English and other Englishers as well. That should have uh, discussed in your context. So the test uh, material writers or the Ministry of Education or the in the school system in Sri Lanka, we do go by a variety, if it is a variety. So that is another thing, really. You just explored uh, the number of idiomatic expressions used in the textbooks. It's not about teaching. It's the, you, you just explored the frequency of idiomatic expressions used in the textbooks. So this could be like, uh, could have been uh, better worded like an exploratory study of the usage of idiomatic expressions in, a textbook, in textbooks. Thank you very much. I will give the chance to the, uh, the audience once again to raise questions from the other presenters. Over to you, please. You can raise questions or make suggestions or comments, really. Yes. Um, it's more of an observation with regard to our third presenter's um, study. I'm really glad that you have chosen this, and um, and I'm really uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that you are looking at these uh, two main languages and uh, you know like how uh, they function in our society and uh, how they have been the cause for many of our conflicts and you actually um, highlight that uh, they should be also they should also have the potential for healing and harmony um, so my observation is regarding when you said in the professional context um, uh, like you know being bilingual in terms of Sinhalese and uh, Tamil could be of an advantage. And I couldn't help uh, thinking that it would have been more holistic if you, I know that you, it may not have been under the uh, scope of your present study, but maybe you could in the future take a look at how the role of English um, is also important in this context. Because you know, like when um, Sinhala was made the official language in 1956, uh, it was a major disadvantage to minorities um, who um, had Tamil or English as their mother tongue. Yes. But now, um, you know, English has also—I mean, English has also made its way back into this uh, this context. Yes. So maybe you can, in the future, um, take a look at it because you know uh, all these politics are relevant to um, 
English as well. Yes, uh, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, yes, it's really valuable because uh, even in the chart that we presented that English as official languages has a high number of population of speaking competency. Well, uh, that's a really good insight and I would be considering to, like we would consider it to further develop in terms of in the professional aspect. So uh, just to give another thought on that, we thought of, you know, highlighting the national language speaking competency in the professional as aspect is because when it comes to the ground level, to, uh, so our uh, interviews who we uh, used in our research study, most of them are ground level people who, you know, uh, negotiate or work with uh, ordinary farmers, workers in you know, almost all provinces. So for them, actually, that's English is still not approachable. I'm not saying that it, it isn't a solution, but still, even though uh, the, the interviews that we interviewed said that when they were working, they felt it was an important to learn their language. Like, for example, uh, we have one uh, respondent from the Northeast who is actually a Turkish Red Cross representative who carries out all the Turkish Red Cross uh, projects in North and East, uh, especially on terms of uh, social welfare and child health care and women's health care with the help of the Turkish government and the Turkish Red Cross. So he was, uh, in his responses also he noticed, noticed that when he was working with the people, especially with the Tamil community in the North and East, he couldn't communicate with them in a more like a genuine way. He had to use a translator. And he also said that uh, most of the people, like uh, what he felt during that work, during his work was because when he was working with those people, th those people were like not giving the genuine thoughts because they were giving it to one of their person. So there is a, like a, uh, that's another research problem between their, so the trans, there's a caste problem there, that's another problem. But he said that what if he learned the Tamil language and, and speak Tamil with them directly, he would have not faced that kind of a like, you know, environment. So that's why like he suggested, you know, it's better if we could our community, especially people who are willing to work in the North and East, and people who are willing from the North and East who are willing to work in the South, in terms of their professional aspect, it's better to improve their speaking competency of a second national language instead of going through an English language. In the ground, it can be different from, for example, corporates has another different perspective, but when it comes to, you know, social welfare, non-governmental organization, I think that, uh, that's why we highlighted the professional aspect should be there. So thank you for any of your suggestion and we would really like to consider it. Excellent answer, thank you. Any other questions from the, any other presenters? The other, yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a question for so this is the question for the fourth presenter. Thank you very much for your very, I mean, I'm also a, a teacher, so basically it's interesting because I also mark students' answers and when they write research papers, etc. So one, this is like slash uh, comment slash suggestion sort of thing, because we always think when it comes to academic writing, uh, we should exclude, we shouldn't use the article I, you know, I, we, etc. We, I, uh, the article, uh, we, I will not touch upon even I agree that we is like out. But with the article I, uh, I think there's this tradition of writing uh, influenced by the philosopher called Karl's, uh, Karl Popper. So if you go with that tradition of writing, uh, especially in the field of humanities, uh, the it's actually encouraged, you know, the inclusion of the I because uh, the, the role of the researcher rather than uh, like actually apologizing for having a voice in the article or in the research, uh, rather than like apologizing for it, like being present in the art, uh, in the research is like appreciated in that school of thinking. So basically inclusion of the I is encouraged. For example, if you look at uh, identity studies uh, in research, like you know, teacher identity, student identity studies, etc. In that branch of thinking, uh, it's sort of encouraged, the you know, uh, researcher's point of view, inclusion of the I. So I just wanted to point to that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, do you have anything to say? Yes. Thank you very much for your service.
Would you like to comment on that? Okay, uh, shall we uh, uh, leave the, yes. This question is also for the fourth speaker. Actually, uh, um, the lady there actually raised half of what I had on mind. Um, just a comment, and maybe you can also comment on it after you hear what it is. Um, so I also, coming from a literary background, my problem with, uh, my ideological problem with what you were yes. saying is like, I think there's this, uh, uh, in, in um, when you are a student learning in English, uh, for academic purposes, encouraging the I in writing. If you are not a literary person, it's not good. That's what the domain of teaching tells us. We tell our students not to write, use the passive voice, etc. Yeah. There are yeah. other ways. But if you are writing from a kind of a very 100% literary perspective, like she said, mm. you need the voice to come out. You don't have to necessarily say I but the I, the voice is important. I'm sure she would also agree with me, the same thought. I would like to know what, um, have you, did you think about that perspective? Because are you focusing on the second language learners writing and studying for certain degrees in English? Was that the focus? Or did you think about that particular kind of student? Did you leave them out? I would like to know. Uh, thank actually, you. Actually, thank you very much for both. Uh, uh, questioners. Uh, yeah, actually I have known about that, but uh, there are some uh, styles at Harvard, APA, sometimes we use like uh, I, we pro the personal pronouns, especially for the reflections matter. So here, uh, basically I uh, focus my study uh, based on the proposal writing, research proposal writing uh, in the law uh, undergraduate, so that's what uh, actually, yeah, actually uh, uh, I focus, uh, we are not using personal pronouns. Yeah, let me intervene really, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for the questions as well as the comments really. Uh, the questions I think raised is that uh, uh, we do use uh, personal pronouns. And what your study perhaps was to explore the frequency of hedging yes. adverbials and the personal pronouns in proposals uh, in order to come out with some of the recommendations, whether to use I or whether, to, whether not to use, I think you do have to refer to some of the different thoughts of uh, different schools and their ideologies as well. You can, of course, this can be considered as, a, as an initial exploratory study where you measure the frequency of such such mm -hmm. different aspect in your in your students' proposals, and let me ask a question in line with that. In your in your presentation, you mentioned. I just wanted to know this really, whether your the uh, the the proposals that you have collected from your students yes. uh, did they write? Did the students write the proposals simply for your research? Did they write the proposals for your research, specifically for your no, research? No, actually, no, there's a module called research writing. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. let me then uh, like uh, get back to your proposal and the presentation. Yeah. In your methodology, you yes. have mentioned uh, the proposals as part of your methodology. Proposals yes. is not, not, writing proposals is not part of your methodology. It's just a normal common thing and you have collected your documents from the proposals. Yes. So I think that has to be, should have been mentioned clearly and explicitly. Uh, also, uh, uh, you were talking about uh, error analysis and things like that. I think before you get into some analysis of that nature, yeah. you do have to incorporate the literature and uh, your <laughs> aim. And what I have noted is your aim was to explore the frequency of the examples Personal that you have examples. presented in yeah. your study. The exploring the frequency, and if you want to move beyond that, you need to do it with your theoretical backup. Okay, thank you very right. much. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, this is a suggestion. For the moment, I wanted to introduce that uh, the corpus, uh, the mini corpus uh, for uh, our, I mean, investigating research uh, culture. So that's, that is not the objective uh, for that. Okay. Uh, questions for the second, uh, other, other presenters as well. Yeah, we have uh, five to eight minutes more. If you have any suggestions or comments, you can ask from anybody. Yeah, sure. I have a question for the third presenter. Okay. So when we, when we were undergraduates, we, we presented in similar conferences and we got questions from the audience. And then that was the improvement you, I got. So similarly, when it comes to next presentation, next conference, we will be ready for the question, that is why we are asking questions, <laughs> right? Uh, no one's there. Okay, so um, my question is, now in your study you selected six participants. Nine participants. Nine participants. What can be the reason for that? Well, first of all, this research was carried out on 2021 at the height of COVID. Mm. So when we were doing our bachelor's research, so we had a huge challenge on in terms since uh, Almost all our university work was done in online, especially our final, uh, uh, our research uh, semester was done in online and it was the height of the COVID peak in Sri Lanka. We had a huge challenge in, in terms of uh, gathering data and you know, in terms of ex executing those interviews because some of the individuals rejected our interviews because they were either busy with, most of our individuals that we tried to get were from the public sector because public sector is engaged in our research topic, especially in the North and East, some of these individuals rejected because they did not have time. But uh, with, with the help of our supervisor and the department, they suggested try to somehow, uh, try to utilize, utilize the resources that you got. So we had a huge challenge in terms of traveling because at that, at that moment the country was on a lockdown. So like in the presentation I think I mentioned, most of our interviews were conducted either in uh, uh, virtually or face to face. So in terms of those interviews, when it, like uh, uh, in terms of doing those interviews, some of the individuals who were living in the north could not even participate virtually. So we had to take phone calls as well. And then later get them someone to virtual interview. So it, there was a challenge in terms of traveling. That's why we had to limit our scope very much for this problem. Okay. <coughs> Thank you for the question and the uh, answer really. Uh, my question also goes to the third speaker. This is a suggestion, of course. Uh, I, I believe that it was uh, slipped, really. On your presentation, you have mentioned at times, like uh, you, main, you maintain a focus group interview. Did you do a focus group interview? Did you do focus group interviews or individual interviews? So, uh, within the uh, group, we had individual, uh, nine individuals, for we tried to get to a focus group, but we no, individually no, my, my question is this. You interviewed nine individuals. Yes. Nine individuals yeah. only. But you mentioned uh, on one of your slides, as your methodology, you did the thing called focus group interviews. This is another terminology. For focus group interview means you may have a group where you may have several individuals and you may meet them and consider the many individuals as one case. So which was, I, I considered, I believe that it was a slip, of course. Oh please yeah. uh, please uh, correct it really. Sure, and see me Thank you so much for yeah, it's me a, that. There are two different things, individual interviews and the focus group interviews. Also, uh, uh, and in your methodology, it would have been better had you mentioned how you have selected this nine people, nine, indi nine individuals, and why you have, uh, it was not uh, explicit in your presentation, why you have uh, limited to nine, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, how long did you interview? What sort of questions did you ask? That is in interesting and important as well, because unlike in the other, many other the presentations, you were exploring the opinions, perceptions of some of these individuals. So therefore, the types of questions would be really, would have added quality and credit to your presentation and type of quality. And, and, uh, and something which 
which I was really looking to see in your presentation was some of your, your data. Because these are opinions. I would have loved to see some of the opinions. You have come out with the thematic uh, 509 themes, really, and we did not know how did you come out, how did you, like, yeah. how the themes were emerged, really. And uh, uh, at some of the questions, questions, at least some of the questions and the findings. A couple of fi findings would have been added to your, added some, uh, you know, credit to your presentation. Also, uh, my, my general comment applies to everybody, I once again tell you, s your recommendations. Many of your recommendations are not the recommendations that you have uh, obtained from the current study, from the study that you have done. And some of your claims, I'm just passing a general comment really, just to conclude as well, and, uh, and some of your comments are general, general comments, generalized comments. Let me just, uh, I think everybody came out with such comments really, right? And let me just, uh, since I'm talking to the third speaker, let me comment, let me refer to this, uh, this fact. Now, in some of your lines you mentioned the current education system, I'm something to this effect, right? This is how I have worded it. The current education system does not develop speaking competency in the individuals. How and is that a result of your current research? Yes or no? Yes. Like, uh, for example. Okay, let me say, okay, yes. If you are to say that current education system has not developed the language competency, you could have just uh, interviewed several people and how do I speak in English and how do many of us speak in English? It's thanks to our education system. And how do you, it's the, because of the education system. You understood my point? Yes. And you were exploring some of the opinions of some of your participants. So make sure when you make some claims of this nature, these are very like, you know, the general comments, maybe your general observation, your generally, or else you should have proved this with evidence. So you have mentioned that, I'm just quoting an extracted like a sentence, right? education, current education system does not develop speak in English. So those are some of the generalized comments you, which you have not definitely come across through the current research. You have just explored nine people's opinions. Nine people's opinions. So let them present them as their opinions. The opinions may be useful for our future policies, definitely. That's something else. But you cannot come to conclusions by based on, like, uh, like by, by taking only nine people's opinion. One person might have told you, one individual or one participant, or all nine participants might have told you, uh, okay, I did not learn anything from my school education. Yes, true. Simply because of that, you cannot come to a conclusion in a research of this nature saying that English education or the current school education system does not develop English speaking skills or something like that. I hope I'm clear to you. Yes, ma'am. I agree. Right. Okay. And uh, if you have any further questions or comments, uh, well. Yeah. And if we are so cautious about our recommendations and findings to write the findings based on the current research, this problem would not happen really. Because what had happened is we do bring in a lot of our like normal observations and what, what we have discussed in our classrooms generally as if that they are the they are the findings of our research. Whatever the research findings that you mentioned in your research papers should be the ones which were, which were taken from your current research. From your current research as the findings, as the findings. You may refer to the literature review and the past thing, that's something else. And uh, that's, that's, that's what I, I even told you about uh, you as well, really, the second speaker, really. Uh, when you say the, the idiomatic expressions, okay, the, 
our school system, you, you say, for example, you mention and you give, a, you give a solution, say, in recommendation to the, as if to the Minister of Education, idiomatic expressions of different varieties should be included in the older textbooks. So before you come to that conclusion, right, you should have explored the policies and the practices and the principles of the Minister of Education and whatever the policies that we have taken here, really. What you have done is, it's a good thing. You have explored the idiomatic expressions, the frequency of idiomatic expressions in one of the textbooks. To come to your conclusion, perhaps you do have to do further studies. Why they have not been included, maybe then you may in incorporate uh, some of the policies. And also, I don't remember, as I remember very, like, I, I think it's the first speaker or some, no, uh, someone who did on Noorelia, you, yeah. The speaker and you were talking about the interviews really but your interview data was not available here you interview no that, that's important because you have talked with the opinions this is an exploratory study the opinions are important and in your study what were your research tools what were your research tools research instruments interview so the but uh, interview data was not here what you have pointed out and presented to us is the documents and the logos and the, the you know, the sign boards and etc. So then your research instruments, it's good. Your research instrument should have been mentioned as, yes, I had two research instruments. One is to do an interview. And the second one is the documents which includes sign boards and the, and the application forms that you have collected from the land registry and something like that. You showed them, but that you showed them. So your research instrument, one, great, one major research instrument was missing in your presentation and even in the abstract, right? And you should have mentioned it. And on the other hand, the other, other instrument, the, the fact that you have done, you claim that you have done interviews. So give some details about them here. That is where you have done your research. That is where you would do and Your credit can be shown and exhibited. The what you have done, right? That part was missing, completely missing in your, the data of the interview was missing and you were, you were talking about the documents, the language of the documents, right? Okay, consider these things as suggestions for you to improve and thank you very much once again for your effort and I would highly appreciate your effort and good luck for your future research attempts really. And shall we give another round of applause to everybody? I think that's it, right? Okay, thank you very much for listening to us and thank you very much for like uh, being, uh, being here and participating in this uh, occasion. And yes, thank you very much. <laughs> that's it and this ends the session. Sorry. Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. That was an inspiring scholarly session. All these valuable insights gave us a new perspective that one should adopt while discussing these issues. On behalf of all, I would like to thank Madam Chitra Jatilaka for chairing this session and the four presenters for the valuable knowledge that they shared with us. It is with great honor that I invite the chairperson of the TESOL Technical Session 2, Professor Chitra Jayatilaka, to give away the certificates for the presenters. Ms. H.M. Mal Gunavardhana, 